What's up, Energy Fam? This is Justin, and welcome back to another episode of Wicked Energy with JG. My goal with each episode is to deconstruct the minds of today's energy thought leaders to uncover their framework and tools used in their journeys of providing energy to the world. So sit back, relax, and remember that everything you see around you requires some form of energy. Go ahead. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. I'm excited. I'm here with fellow and senior director of global supply chain management initiatives at Occidental, aka Oxy. We have Miss Shauna Noonan. Shauna, welcome to the show. How's everything going in your world today? Well, considering today's a Friday, everything is fantastic. And thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I appreciate you making time. Uh, so, you know, we're not we're not going to have this uh, up on YouTube for, for a couple of reasons. But um, you said you were hitting, you were doing something active this morning. And so I'm very curious. You said you were hitting balls. I'm assuming it's either pickleball, tennis, or golf. Which one? Um, it's golf. Nice. And it's quick trying to do it in the early hours before work, but also too in Texas, we're suffering a heat wave. So in order for tr me to try and keep up my game, because you know, in the oil and gas industry, fall season is a big golf tournament, charity event season. Yeah. And I'm all for getting the scholarships and, and getting the money out there, whether it's for bringing new people in the industry or whether it's for helping us to educate the public. Yeah. Um, I gift my golf ball to the golf course for a good cause. <laughs> <laughs> That's like us, us in the oil field service side. Uh, we purposely put our logos on our balls and we call it cheap marketing because most of us, uh, we play at a fair amount, but we do lose a lot of balls. And instead of trying to find them, we just chalk it up as marketing dollars. So it's totally cool. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So uh, we're, I mean, speaking of summer, yes, it's been extremely hot. Um, what has been the highlight of your summer? The highlight of my summer was actually a trip I made back to our motherland, Canada, last week. Yeah. Um, went back to the small farm communities of Alberta where was my beginning, but it was really making me remember how and what attracted me to become a petroleum engineer in the first place. Okay, perfect. So, and, and, I, and I do want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but before I get going, uh, so you mentioned that, where did you go back to in Alberta? So I went east of Edmonton. Uh, there's a lot of farm communities there. There are east of Camrose, there's Killam, Hardesty, Lougheed, and chances are, uh, I have DNA connections to about half the population. Really? Okay. So, uh, Real quick on that front, where, so where you originally, like, did you grow up in a certain spot or did you move around or where did you grow up? So I was born in Edmonton. Okay. And I spent my younger years in Sherwood Park, which is a community just outside of Edmonton. I know exactly. And then, well, then you must remember too, so similar what Tex, what Baird's bread is to Texas, McGavin's bread was to Canadian. <laughs> okay. And my father was an executive for McGavin. And ah. so their corporate headquarters was in Vancouver, British Columbia. So in grade five, my father got transferred to BC. And that's where I spent the rest of my formative years was in British Columbia. Okay. So similar-ish, uh, I was born in Calgary to the age of five. And then my mom and I moved to Vernon, BC. And my grandma helped raise me. Uh, my mom was working for Air Canada. Um, and so she was bouncing around from Alberta to back to BC. And so, yeah, I grew up in BC in the heart of the Okanagan, which I, which I deeply miss. Uh, and <laughs> unlike yourself, I haven't been back in a long time. We have young kids. And then obviously the pandemic threw a wrench into that. My mom's there right now in Kelowna. And she just sent me a message this morning and the fires are insane. Are you, I mean, do you have any family that are being affected by that right now? Um, I actually have a nephew that's been, well, was in Yellowknife up until a few days ago, and they've evacuated oh. the whole city. And uh, thankfully, he's managed to to get out. Um, yeah, the the wildfires everywhere, whether it's in Canada, currently Maui, and even in the U.S. Oh. It's, um, I'm sure everybody at least has some sort of connection to somebody that's been impacted by that. 
Yeah. No. And, and for those that, that are listening, hopefully none of you have, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been devastating and, and, um, geez, I just hope the weather can kind of turn around and especially here, I mean, everywhere get a little rain and, and, and some, some cooler weather. Um, but with that said, so, and then <laughs> real quick, so I, and we'll go back cause I want to hear your story about, you know, cause again, coming from BC, getting into petroleum engineering, you go to U of A, uh, which is pretty cool, but I was curious before we got on that topic, I was going through your LinkedIn because I wanted to do a little bit of research. Um, and I couldn't help but notice that you're a certified facilitator of Lego serious play. What in the yeah. world is that? <laughs> hey everyone, sorry to interrupt, but this episode is sponsored by 10X Technologies, pushing the boundaries of chemistry. 10X is innovating the future of the oil and gas industry with their proprietary materials based technology solutions. With cutting edge products like NanoClear, custom designed nanofluids engineered to maximize the production of new completions and rejuvenate existing wells, 10X is driving a revolution in oil extraction. Meet Microhold, a specially engineered microparticle slurry that optimizes frac efficiency, props microfracs, and triggers far field diversion every well, every time sees the benefits. And if you're worried about frac hits, 10X has you covered with no hit. An innovative technology that mitigates frac hits via in situ pressurization reaction. Is protection where you need it most. Then there's Sandbond, a sand consolidation chemical solution that's just another example of 10X's commitment to practical field-ready solutions. And let's not forget about Seraflow, a greener, cost-effective, proprietary blend of design materials to banish paraffin issues once and for all. That's 10X, where innovation meets application in the oil and gas industry. Find out more about their groundbreaking solutions at pumpmoreoil.com and be on the lookout for five. Yeah, you heard it, five new products launching soon. Now, let's get back to the show. So, Lego uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, they were struggling to be a little bit more innovative uh, as, as a company. Okay. And they reached out to a series of educators that specialized into ways you can stimulate the brain and more free thought when it comes to brainstorming than trying to drive innovation. Cause they felt that they didn't need to hire consultants to come in per se and tell them how to be more innovative. They just needed more, some guidance as to how to use their own product to be innovative. So they developed this method. I guess we're all familiar, like, for example, fidget spinners. Yeah. Right? And if our hands are busy, sometimes it frees up our mind and thought. Yes. Well, if you could have that motion, but at the same time, create structures or things that would serve as a metaphor or a visualization trigger, it could actually, again, help in the brainstorms the innovation. Part. So anyway, they created this internal method called Lego Serious Play. And it was such a hit that they actually open sourced it. Oh, wow. So anybody's available to read about it, but really you have to be trained as a facilitator to properly lead the, the sessions in a way that was meant to be. Um, I first ran across it at a Society of Women Engineers event last year. There's a medical instruments company called Medtronic. And they gave a presentation on how throughout the company, whether it's doing organizational changes, brainstorming, trying to figure out why uh, certain software was failing. They bring in a uh, Lego serious play facilitator, but they, they pay for their own people to be facilitators. And they said they've made the world a difference. And here's an interesting example. So they said in one aspect, they wanted to uh, make their software group aware of why they were having problems with the software they were having. And so mm. the facilitator came in if you permit me a few minutes, this will be a quick story. No worries. And said, okay, you've got the pieces in front of you. Uh, build four walls. Okay, so everybody's building their four walls. And then the facilitator said, okay, now you, you need to add a door, but you can't change anything. So then they're trying to figure out. And then later, okay, you need to add a window, but you can't change anything. And so on so forth. So at the end, you kind of get this Frankenstein of a house structure. And the point they were trying to get across and they needed the visual, visualization of the session for the software group was every time you try and add a new feature to the software, you're not going back and rebuilding back to the base to make it more functional and basically more effective. All you're doing is you're creating the, 
Frankenstein every time you do a new feature app. Oh. Um, I recently used it with an Oxy just more for team development, getting people to discuss what they thought more their strengths, their weaknesses, fosters communication. Anyway, it's a wonderful, there's lots of YouTube videos on it. And um, if you Google, there's information, but yeah. And I get to play with Lego at work. <laughs> yeah, no, what a, what a neat, what a neat opportunity. And so how, how is it being receptive with your teams? Is it something that they, they value and that they take, uh, they take serious or is it more just like team building? Uh, right now it's been team building. I'm looking to uh, expand it a little bit more in the innovation space. I just actually haven't had the time to do that yet. So if you were to touch base with me in a year, I'll have a lot more to tell you. Yeah. Well, I think it's cool to share. And then maybe, you know, other people listening or our cooperators or companies in general can adopt something like that. I think those types of tools are super, super helpful. Um, finding creative ways to to become innovative, to collaborate, uh, to, communicate. And to communicate, which is in oil and gas, in my opinion, is our biggest downfall is we have a very, we do a very poor job of communicating on a number of different levels. And so again, that's something that can help. Um, very cool. Very cool. So going back to Shauna as a, as a young lady growing up in British Columbia, how in the world and why did you choose petroleum engineering at the University of Alberta, which I mean, imagine University of Alberta is kind of close to home. So that made sense. But why petroleum? Well, it wasn't a direct line to petroleum. And okay. as you know, being raised in British Columbia, there isn't necessarily a huge pro oil and gas <laughs> population. Right. Correct. <laughs> uh, all I knew is when I graduated high school that I wanted, like many young people, to get as far away from home as you could. Yeah. And originally, I got accepted into Queen's University, which is in Ontario. And at the time, I don't know if it's the same, where most provinces like BC go up to grade 12 in high school. In Ontario, they went up to grade 13. Mm hmm. And so once I got my acceptance, they gave me a two-month notification that I had to have a full year of calculus before I could start at Queen's. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to cram a year of calculus in two months. So I went right. to my second second pick, which is the University of Alberta, nice. which was my mom's alma mater. Um, and I actually went into the pre-med program. Okay. Uh Let's just say, okay, my mother was an educator. She was very influential with academic, with the family. And for Christmas, I would get anatomy coloring books. Uh, and any okay. sort of reading book to do with a medical profession, because she was grooming. She wanted a doctor in the family. Uh, it, wasn't it, it wasn't until I got to University of Alberta and realized that it wasn't necessarily the content or the program per se that I didn't enjoy. It was actually more the people around me. It was extremely competitive. Um, and then at the time I started hanging around with the folks that were in the engineering department and it was a lot more collaborative. When I was looking at their coursework, it actually interests me a lot more. But then, mm -hmm. and then again, going back to my family and saying I was going to switch from pre-med to engineering. It's funny you led in with the Lego piece because as a child, I was not allowed to have Lego because that was a boy's toy. Wow. Okay. So I would always play with my brother's Lego. And I wasn't until a family friend when I was 13 years old gave me my first Lego kit. <laughs> no way. That is so fascinating. And what's fascinating is, and I, my mother's very well aware of this, and I know she's not going to hear this podcast, but <laughs> for, for someone that was an educator and it was still very much in the stereotypes, because even when I went back to my family to say I was going to switch my major from pre-med to engineering, one of the first things that came was, well, engineers are for boys, like the engineering mm -hmm. for boys. So um, anyway, there wasn't a direct line. And then... When I was looking at what part of engineering I wanted to go into, it was actually a, a petroleum engineering professor at the University of Alberta who was quite well known. Um, his name was Dr. Flock. And he mentioned to me that, at, especially as a female, there would be a lot of doors open to me in oil and gas, uh, not just domestically, but internationally, because the 
that the awareness was out there, the small number of females that were in the oil and gas industry, and there was going to be a big push to increase that. Yeah. Um, that wasn't the sole reason why I went, and let's just I'll put it on record, I'm totally against um, gender quota. I just think everybody, regardless of their background, have the same opportunity, but then you get that opportunity based on your merit. Yeah. No, that's in the, I think that's a very sta fair statement. And it, that one's at least kind of hard to argue in my opinion. Um, but no, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, you, you obviously worked hard. You went against the status quo. You went against what your parents were, or your, at least your mom was doing and which I did. I mean, did it kind of put a little bit of a chip on your shoulder that gave you fuel to the fire in a sense? I mean, were you kind of like, you know what, like I'm going to prove you wrong and you're going to be proud of me one day. Like watch this. Uh, yeah. In a, in a bit, um, I think it was more trying to prove to those that uh, my former teachers and uh, colleagues in high school, you know, because they're, it, to them, I did this abrupt 180. And let's just <laughs> yeah. say I, I was not a very good physics student in high school, but then realizing it was more of the method of teaching, because once I got to college, I rocked it. Um, it was just more nice. to prove to them um, that I could do it. And then really the push came once I graduated, so when I graduated, and by the way, I, I did a special engineering program at University of Alberta. It was actually a five-year program. It was a co-op, cooperative mm -hmm. education, where you graduate with 20 months of work experience. So you have five, oh, yeah, four-month yeah. internships. Um, and actually, companies recruit the co-op students over and above the regular engineering because you have to have higher grades, and it's, it's just... A much more appreciative program. Anyway, when I was uh, getting interviews and job offers upon graduation, it was more my uh, fellow engineering students that were saying, well, the only reason why you're getting this is because you were skirt, right? Mm. And so that's been the drive and the force under me my whole career is to prove that I earned what I got on my own merit as yeah. opposed to my plumbing. Um of course. Yeah, no. And that, and I think, that, but I think that brings up a great point. And so for the females that are listening, um, and then we'll pivot uh, after this, but I'm, I'm curious, like, what would you say to young women out there who perhaps are not necessarily struggling to find a way, but are kind of, you know, fear of judgment or fear of, oh, because I am a female in a, in a male dominated industry, generally speaking, what, what kind of advice would you say if someone came up to you on the street and you're, she was like, I'm looking to get an oil and gas, but it's kind of freaks me out. And I don't know what people are going to say. Like, what would you tell that young lady? Well, what I tell them today is the situation is dramatically different than it was 30 years ago when I came in. Right. Um, you know, one, there, there's a higher representation. There's now company policies and education in place. Um, so my path isn't your path, you know, mm. the, the few doors that maybe I had or had a fight to get through, you have a lot more doors of opportunity. So that is not really, uh, that is not something that should hold you back. If it's something that you're interested, you're passionate, you want, uh, career growth, but also work-life balance, then this is the industry for you. And when I emphasize the work-life balance too, that's one thing, regardless of what your gender is in oil and gas, that has dramatically changed over the past 30 years as well. Yeah. Uh, both for male and females, like being able to have the parental bonding, um, again, the outside of having to do uh, rotation positions or even, you know, 12 hour rig days and stuff like that. For, for the most part, there is, it, it, it's not, look, you're not frowned upon for wanting to strive for that work-life balance. Instead of right. it, it's now more expected that you do get it because companies now realize you're going to be a much valuable employee because of it. Yeah. No, that culture has changed dramatically. I mean, I started in 2004 working for Precision out of NISCU um, and even the on the, at the rig level. I mean, I never thought that culture would change and that has actually quite changed quite a bit as well. Um, so again, I think all the way around, uh, it's, it's gotten better. It's, it's, it, it, we've got a much different approach and a healthier approach, I, I think, which is super important. I mean, 
I'm sure you may have seen the headlines or have maybe read the report that Wall Street Journal came out with recently about um, the enrollment with petroleum engineering and just how it's just fallen off a cliff over the last few years. And so, you know, I think that gets into something we'll talk about in a bit is just messaging and communicating what we do uh, to a larger audience who otherwise perhaps think a little bit different of of who we are as oil and gas folks. Um, but that kind of leads me into a question before that is, you, you know, you spent your whole career in oil and gas. I'm sure, you know, just like anyone else in the in 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 the industry, it's we're we're faced with a lot of adversity, whether it be politically, whether it be culturally. Um, but I'm curious if you have any core beliefs around energy that you've changed your mind on over the last few years, and especially with the big push and a lot of the majors in the U.S. are pushing not necessarily on like they're big on the solar and the wind, obviously carbon capture and that sort of landscape, but does anything come to mind that you may have changed your mind over? Uh, yes. So uh, for many, many years, because each of the different energy, whether it's solar, wind, nuclear, or oil and gas, we all operated in a silo and we always made the position that ours is better than yours. Right. And and what the big change about it has been, and it's, it's not with me, it's, it's many others, but again, there's still a lot more people that need to be educated as to, um, we got to stop pointing fingers at who's best, who's worst, and realize that everything is all going to be needed. So yeah. we all better just join hands and, because everything's going to be needed for energy demand, global energy demand, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've actually... I'm, in the last year, year and a half, I have spent a lot more time learning and talking with those in the nuclear space. Okay. And talking about an industry that's been demonized even worse than oil and gas. Right. But but again, they are starting to do a turnaround. I don't know if you've uh, read recently that in the U.S. they just commissioned two new nuclear plants in the state of Georgia. I haven't heard that, but that's exciting to hear. It's exciting to hear, and um, there's even, right now the U.S. government and the Canadian government is working with Westinghouse on these uh, micro reactors where it's the size yeah. of a rail, rail, railroad car. Right, and, okay. And this is something that it's just small little contained unit will put out five megawatts of energy. It is self-contained. It will last for about seven years, and then once you use up that internal fuel source, they just swap it out for another unit. And so this is the the US and the Canadian military are mainly looking at using it more for remote operations, but in oil and gas, we also have a lot of remote operations. And if that's something that's zero emissions, mm. um, so th it's that kind of thing that I'm, I've done an about face on. Um, but again, to back to the position of <laughs> we all have to be educated in all forms of energy. We all have to understand the pros and cons because we all have pros and cons. Right. And, you know, again, just working together. One of the things I really try to do when I was SB president was to try and hold joint conferences that would have the Society of Geothermal Engineers, the Society of Solar Engineers and all that collectively. It, it was hard even at that time from an, a, a big association base to get people to want to come together in the same room. Cause again, we spent so many years kind of being rivals. Yeah. And now I'm starting to see, see that about faith. So that's you my know, big change of epiphany, so to speak. Yeah, no. And, and that's a, you know, it, it's actually been somewhat of a common uh, answer that I've had over the last couple of years is, is just the understanding that all of the above approach makes the most sense. And for those who are, I would say somewhat educated in the space or have at least a, a degree of, of open-mindedness to learn about why it's important that we still have oil and gas. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, I, I would like to believe that we're slowly changing uh, people's minds or at least providing them with information to ask better questions to where they can learn a little bit more about what we do. Um, but you know, that's the, the nuclear thing is, is, is rather fascinating. Um, 
and one thing too, sort of, and, and I'm curious on on the Oxy side is you guys have made a, a very healthy push uh, in a number of different areas with regards to sort of the carbon capture space. And if you would wouldn't mind kind of sharing the mission and sort of the overall landscape of what you guys are trying to do uh, and maybe what sort of the future looks like, uh, I think it would be really neat for people to hear about that if you would. So our CEO, uh, Vicki Hollum, and her team, we've made it. Uh, the message we're trying to get out there is that Oxy is a carbon management company. Uh, mm -hmm. We produce hydrocarbons. But at the same time, our mission is to be producing net zero barrels. So we're looking at ways, and, and we'll also too, we, we've dealt with CO2 for decades. We're uh, one of the largest users of CO2 in, our, in the United States in our uh, CO2 floods. We know how to handle CO2. So it made it very natural for us to shift into, for example, direct air capture, yeah. point source capture, because we know how to capture, well, we know what to do with that CO2 and how to how to sequester it with our knowledge. Um, you know, we've made a very aggressive push with the director capture unit. The first unit has been named at Strato. Uh, we've been very public with um, the information about it. And you can go to oxy.com and... Uh, find out more details, even to we do separate uh, investor industry reports on our low carbon venture initiative. Um, and I think you've probably seen the recent headline too, that we've uh, just done an agreement with Adnoc as well to start bringing direct air capture to the Middle East. I saw that. That's congrats. Okay. And the, 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 what it also makes kind of natural for us is a lot of the process and I wouldn't say materials, but a good part of the DAC, their, their processes and I guess materials or chemicals that we're very familiar with on the OxyChem side. Mm. Um, so, you know, our, our, our confidence with moving with this particular design of the director capture, it just, it just fits us so, so easy. And it, it dovetails very well in, um, the feedstock and the products from the OxyCam side. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah. I think, and I don't, I don't think a lot of people know a, a lot of what you guys are doing in terms of a, I mean, again, it depends on what side of the industry you work on, like me being oil field service side, drilling side. I think of Oxy as this monstrous company who typically deploys a ton of rigs and you drill and produce a lot of oil. And then, you know, which over time I've learned a lot more just by way of, you know, reading and researching and, and genuine curiosity. But um, do, you, do you think, again, broadly speaking, just amongst the U.S. and the larger operators, do you think we're doing a good job of of kind of pushing towards that? Or do you think there's room for improvement? And again, not necessarily specifically Oxy, just just in general, like, are U.S. oil and gas companies making a good job of, of doing that, or do you think there's room for improvement? Uh, the the public companies are making a great effort. Uh, a lot of that is driven because of Wall Street and investors. Um, and that's not saying that they're driving the public companies to do it. They're probably maybe pushing us to be a little bit more, uh, maybe set some targets that maybe aren't necessarily realistic when it comes to the technology development. Hmm. Uh, the big piece that's missing is on the private side. And, you know, they, they're, they, if, if they don't want to do anything, uh, beyond what's required regulatory they don't have to and you're seeing especially in the u.s with land some of the public companies selling properties and assets to the private ones that helps offshed some of the carbon intensity carbon emission intensity on the public companies 
And what it does, and it just, it now is on the books of the privates, but the privates don't necessarily have to do anything about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, uh, and I would imagine the business strategy is slightly different uh, between publics and, and a lot of the privates, you know, it, who's investing, um, which again, goes into a whole nother topic of conversation, but um, it, it is nice to see a lot of the publics make in again, even, even just on the drilling side, again, I, I'm in the drilling world. And so I speak on that, but you know, there's a lot of folks out there that are trying to uh, leverage nearby, like, like power to power the rigs um, to reduce diesel consumption, diesel combustion. Uh, and again, I know it's a small piece of it. And then you have the EFRAC side. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, there's a lot of effort and technology and, and money being put into, to trying to, to, to supply cleaner barrels, right. And which in a way we produce and aside from Canada and maybe other parts of you know Europe, we do produce a lot of the cleanest barrels in the world. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to see. And I think there's, there's still a lot of meat on the bone and I'm, I'm super optimistic for, for Oxy and, and the rest of the U S companies and Canadian companies for that matter. Um, I want to pivot a little bit and, and talk on the branding side. We talked a little bit about it first, but Oxy has always done a good job. And if you've ever been to Minute Maid Park, there's a huge Oxy sign amongst a few other oil and gas folks. Um, but more recently, you guys have decided to slap on the old Oxy uh, logo on the sleeves of all the Astros players, which I think is super cool. What like what what is that about? I mean, is that just increased brand awareness, or is there a certain push for that? Or I just I thought that was so cool when I saw that for the first time. Well, first of all, uh, we love our Astros, yeah, and we love being uh, a contributor to a team that our community and the city loves. Um, I was thrilled to see the Oxy patches on the yeah. Astros, as well as all the branding. And it, it's just, that's one piece of a push that we're trying to get out for brand recognition. Uh, for those that are, are in or have been in the marketing space, you know how valuable brand recognition is. And, and being recognized for that brand for something good. Because <laughs> sometimes brand recognition can go the other way. Right. And when someone were to uh, talk about large oil and companies, large oil and gas companies that are doing something in the energy transition space, uh, usually th the logo that would come to mind would be the BP, the Chevron, yeah. the Exxon Mobil. And really globally, just overall the brand recognition for Oxy um, there's a lot of room for improvement. And so there's been, there's been the big push. So automatically when you see that, that logo coincides with our branding statement, zero in, uh, and again, it, it's zeroing in on, um, you know, carbon emissions, greenhouse gases that we are, uh, you know, going to be a producer of net zero barrel and here's, um, you're going to start seeing that logo in a lot of places outside of the Astros. We've Ooh. run a we've run a company shuttle that goes between Houston and Midland, uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico. You know that's all branded up. Even to our Boston Dynamics dogs that we have, we have one that runs inspection offshore, uh, Gulf of Mexico, and he's all set it up with the Oxy branding. So that's really <laughs> the push. Again, it's it's being recognized when just people see that logo they automatically know what the mission of the company is. Yes. No, I think branding and communication and marketing, again, as us in oil and gas, I feel like we've done, I think maybe because everyone's just so busy, they haven't thought of it or, you know, at least over the years, but now it's the branding and especially with technology and social media, the way it's evolved. I think a lot of companies are starting to leverage that because the reality is there's so much underpriced attention in the technology world and and you know and even that comes down to baseball because anyone who's watching the astros which pretty much most of houston and surrounding area is on tv anytime you see a player you see that oxy badge right and so to your point creating that awareness and the messaging and for companies to to leverage that uh i, I just again i think it's it's critical to to continue to gain support um you mentioned earlier you're an advocate of folks like you know again the alex epstein 
um, Mark LaCour, they've been doing this for a long time. There's some kind of some, some new age folks coming in myself. There's flipping the barrel, Jamie and Maciel. Mm -hmm. There's myself, JP Warren. Um, there's Scott you know, there's Tinker a... too. Scott Tinker is huge because he's managed to crack getting okay. the message on the public, uh, the public TV stations because he's just been picked up across the U.S. and he streams it worldwide. And that's uh, oh. Switch Energy. So he's also made a huge impact as well. Repeat his name because I don't think I'm familiar with it. You said Scott. Uh... Scott Tinker. So he's okay. done a he's done a few documentary. Uh, the first one was several nice. years ago called Twitch, and it was really the first big documentary out there to properly educate uh, the world on just not oil and gas, but kind of the what's needed for the energy transition and people can understand kind of the underlying how are each, what's behind each one of the different energy forms. And then uh, he now, actually, if you just Google uh, Switch Alliance, that's where you'll see all of his public TV, but he's also made big headway in the Texas uh, school curriculum with educating oil and gas. Wow. But what they did is they worked with, there's um, uh, an advanced placement, an AP course that's environmental science, and they actually worked with the developers of the Texas AP environmental science curriculum to properly put the right facts about all the different forms of energy um, and he's got free resource tool that, yeah, wow. it's, alive. it's fantastic. Actually, you should have him on your, as a future podcast. I was just going to say that, uh, I'm going to somehow figure it out, uh, because I think folks like that, again, need to be spoken through a megaphone to, to help create more awareness. Um, so if anyone out there knows this gentleman, or maybe you do, I don't know, either way I'll cold call him cause I'm good at doing that too. Uh, Yeah. Uh, listeners that'll be coming up soon hopefully I'll reach out but uh, you know kind of going back to it all it's it's neat to see um, and especially with now so when I was used to do podcasting for OGGN it was all in person which limited my ability to get folks from outside of Houston now mm -hmm. you know all of a sudden the pandemic hits everyone's on zoom now I have you know I interviewed a lady from uh, she's part of the carbon capture stuff out in um, uh, Scotland you know, I'm interviewing people from all over the world, which is so cool because we can talk amongst each other. We can further globalize it because en energy flows through every <laughs> part of the world. Um, and hopefully more in a lot of the places that have uh, that face energy poverty, uh, you know, which is, again, to, to think, I think, you know, right now, I think there's about 800 million people who don't even have access to clean water, I think is the number when I checked last. But not everyone has access to electricity, which it, it's getting pretty close. But at the, at the end of the day, there's a lot of areas where, you know, and that's another interesting topic. And I'm, I'm curious to, to hear yours on this. But when we think of trying to come up with solutions, we always pull from a talent pool. And that talent pool is contingent on, you know, who has access to energy. Whereas if you're someone in, say, the middle of nowhere, and you are extremely intelligent, you work hard, but you can only write or do your work when the sun's up, because when the sun's down, you have no access to be able to have any light. Think of how many people are out there that could help contribute to and solve these, a lot of these complex problems that don't have access to the same resources like you and I do. If we could all give them access to the things that we have, um, you know, perhaps not at the scale because things take time. I think we could accelerate the solutions uh, and, and, and try and, you know, get to this and get to the place where we can leave the world a better place than where we came. Cause I think that's ultimately the goal, right? So the last number I saw was we're around 900 million people around the world don't have access to electricity. Okay. Basically, energy crime. And actually going back, that's the whole, the whole energy poverty um, documentaries and stuff. I guess that's actually, again, Scott Tinker's messaging. Um, the one thing that like, a, a, a lot of the energy poverty, again, is in underdeveloped countries. And it was very interesting. It was, I don't know whether it was Modi himself or someone in his cabinet, again, is saying, look, you developed countries, you cannot expect us to become a developed country by quickly jumping in the whole uh, net zero space, right? Um, yes, we're building coal plants, um, but we, right now, we, you know, we, we need to do what you did years ago to start building out 
this electrical infrastructure mm -hmm. for then, uh, then once we can, once we can get everybody, not on electricity again to it, it, it ties in the education, it ties in with healthcare, it ties in actually with, uh, life expectancy. Um, let us get to this level. So then, then too, we can then start focusing on the transition, whether it's you know, solar, wind, whatnot, but we yeah. have to start almost a ground zero, just like you do. Uh, th th I do want to tie into something you mentioned at the beginning to uh, the article in the Wall Street Journal mm. and how people have to watch that. Okay, so the premise of that article, and it, depending on oil and gas cycle, we see it's, it's almost like a deja vu, right? Yeah. <laughs> where the num number of petroleum graduates go down and it always lags with oil price, right? Right. Um, by several years, but there were more petroleum engineering graduates being pumped out worldwide than the oil and gas industry could sustain even in its heyday. You okay. know, Brazil, just Brazil alone had over 30 petroleum engineering schools. Brazil? For Brazil. Africa wow. pumps out. You, you have countries pumping out more petroleum um, graduates than their own countries could handle. And then what you do is then you flood the market with all these international students that have problems getting jobs because of visa requirements in other countries. Um, so the fact mm. that schools are starting to close down petroleum departments are closing down in some of these countries europe for example don't take that as a sign of the oil and gas industry is doomed mm. what that's actually doing is it's now starting to bring parity as to the jobs that are available for students so we don't have a lot of poor petroleum students that just can't can't get jobs uh, but also, wow. too, it just raises the, the, the quality of education because you get these, of course, with all these schools, you're going to have to have faculty to teach, right? And with all these schools elsewhere, and that's one thing, SBE actually tried to do a study as to the number of petroleum engineering schools that were out there globally, and okay. we couldn't do it because there are so many out there that are not documented china for example was a huge oh, problem yeah. we know the schools exist but trying to get a handle on the number of schools was a big problem wow. um so again this wall street journal don't think of it as we're doomed the numbers are going down and there's that uh paul harvey there's the other side of the story yeah and that's kind of the other side of the story it's actually bringing parity down we can get overall worldwide petroleum graduates down to a level where now we can increase the the quality of faculty due mm. to the, the smaller number of schools and then you know it, it uh I, anyway i i just i just think it's it, it's better and it's something that i actually i've been touting about for years that we had way way more petroleum programs than needed yeah well no it's it's fascinating right when you zoom out it tells a totally different story uh and so you know, I'm sure A&M and, and the rest of the folks down here are kind of, you know, sad about it. But the reality is, is as, as a globe, we're actually sitting pretty, which is super cool. I, I, I never really considered that because, um, yeah, A&M, LSU, OOU, U of H, those aren't the only uh, petroleum engineering schools in the world. So around, I think they like had six on there, or however many they had. But yeah. um, but nonetheless, no, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think it's fascinating. Uh, again, the more you know. Uh, is uh it's important to just continue to, to learn and to, to be curious uh you mentioned earlier when and i was thinking about this uh talking about in you know developing nations where initially is like they just want access to energy and then in time they'll be more focused on uh perhaps i don't know being more i guess studious or uh focus more on on the environmental aspects and impacts of energy consumption um in in power can you know generation but it it reminds me of uh have you ever heard of the environmental kuznick curve because you basically described it and it's 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 a it's a it's a 
basically a, a hypothesis that describes the relationship between economic growth and environmental quality. And it's basically an inverted U-shaped relationship between economic output per capita and then some measures of environmental quality. And so it, it, it's used to describe that as like pre-industrial, you know, the level of environmental degradation goes up. And then once you become in like an industrial economy, it peaks. And then post-industrial, it actually goes down. And so people have to kind of go through that cycle to get to the other side. But a lot of folks, like to your point, you can't just jump in and right away have like no level of environmental degradation when you're trying to become industrial. So it's, again, we dive down a rabbit hole there, but uh, it's just an interesting hypothesis that when you were talking about that, I'm like, that totally is what that is. So um, anyway, I don't know if you've heard of it, but if you haven't Google it for the listeners, the more, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> um, with that being said, I know we're coming up close to, to an hour here. And so I want to respect your time um, real quick taking a pivot I, i'm curious what your thought is i mean you're in oil and gas what is your thought around the idea of peak demand are we close not very are you like that's just a bunch of baloney where where, where do you kind of stand on that or just fun thoughts around it so the one thing first is I, when people talk about peak demand we first go in and look at what they perceive peak is because in many parts of the world, when I was touring as SD president, especially with the younger generation, to them, what came after the peak was the cliff, <laughs> right? The, yeah. but basically, peak is the top of the cliff, and once we reach peak, that's it. There's not going to be demand. Right. And again, it's educating that peak does not mean cliff. Yes, ultimately, we will have a, a peak in oil and gas demand. But what's up for debate is what happens after the peak. And uh, I've always believed that it's going to be a very gradual downtrending slope. But again, not based on barrels of oil per day being on the access. It's the percentage of total makeup in the energy mix. Ah, uh, Yes. So, you know, great, say is, so, you know, even with what the forecasts are, because as we start bringing out or reducing energy poverty, global energy demand is going to be huge, so much more than what we're collectively able to do now. Yeah. Right. So all forms of energy are going to increase based on the BTUs or barrels of oil, whatnot they contribute. But what's going to change is that overall mix. So when I see oil and gas peak, yes, at one point, the other forms of energy are going to start taking over that percentage that has been dominated by oil and gas. But overall, when you look at the total barrels and BTUs and that going into it, everybody's increasing. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. And no, I, feel bad, good... I feel bad for the those that are listening on the podcast because Justin's looking at me through my computer and I, I, I very much talk with my hand. And yeah, so you add you so much animation <laughs> to this. The intensity of the conversation is uh, like the ne next level here. So, <laughs> so, so, he, so Justin, the, he could probably understand because he sees I'm doing half the conversation with my hands, but those that are listening or not. So I, <laughs> sorry, my bad. You, you, you can feel the energy though. So it's totally fine. Uh, you know what I mean? It's, uh, but this is, it's good. No, you can, there's clearly a passion behind it, which, regardless if you're listening or, or watching, which you won't be watching, but you, you can feel it. Um, that's, uh, that's good. And you know, again, too, is I think another big topic of discussion, we don't have to go down there right now is just maintaining production and, and keeping up with the vast amount of declines that we're seeing. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion around, you know, the, the, the well productivity in places like the Permian and other places and the amount of water and gas that are coming along with that. And, um, again, for those that are worried that like rate counts is going to fall off a cliff, like you said, um, again, a lot of my listeners are, are on the, the upstream and, and the drilling side completion side is, um, regardless, there's a lot of activity that's going to be needed and a lot of capital that's going to have to be deployed just to keep up with what current production is. Um, so again, it's, uh, no, I don't think anyone really too worries about it, but uh, you, you bring up an interesting point about what happens after 
peak demand. And so uh, I'll have to kind of look into that because that's just something that, that I'm interested in as well. Um, but with that said, we're, we're getting close to noon. I do want to respect your time, but I do want to close out with something interesting. I always find, and someone like yourself being from Canada, I, I, I may have some ideas, but what for you, if you had all the money in the world, you could spend it with whoever you wanted to, what's your ideal Friday night look like without any limitations whatsoever? Oh, my goodness. Ah, oh, surrounded with a lot of my friends. Um, and my, my oil and gas family are my close friends. Um, that's why I enjoy going to conferences so much. It's just more the people. So yeah, it, it'd be a night of celebration, me showing my appreciation to all of those that have lifted me up career-wise, emotionally, spiritually. Um, wow. Yeah, I'm just having a big party. Nice. I love that. Just a big party with people you love. That's... Uh... Yeah. That is, you know, again, and but that I don't think is too far fetched. You know what I mean? Some people will say, "Oh, I'd love to go to Italy and and do this, and then fly here and do that." When which I think is cool. It's kind of like if you win the lottery, you have all these wild ideas. But uh, I think your your answer is very humble, and I think it's it's uh, it's very true to who you are and just your level of appreciation for others and and the people. And our industry is all about the people, um, and I think people have to focus on that. And and not only our industry is like. I encourage everyone to have a degree of empathy towards folks in other industries that are supporting energy. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, it takes all of us. Um, and so Shauna, this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. Um, for those who are listening, who want to connect, or at least just kind of follow your, your, uh, your journey, um, you're on LinkedIn. Do you put out any other content or do you just focus more on, on LinkedIn? Uh, well, I, I focus on LinkedIn. I don't necessarily, I'm not, necess, I'm not an active poster because I see too many people are treating LinkedIn more like a Facebook person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and if, if people want to connect with me on LinkedIn, they need to put a message as to, you know, why it, it, instead of just a broad, don't, don't, you know, heck, I want to connect with this person. You know, yeah. have put in a few sentences saying what you would anticipate getting out of this LinkedIn relationship, or where did we meet, or right. stuff. Because because especially too with my involvement in SCE, I get hit up. <laughs> you get a lot of messages. And I get I get okay. a, I get I get a lot of LinkedIn. Um, but then also too, just for kind of like a photo gifty, I do have a public Facebook page. So. Oh, cool. All my world tours when I have to be present, all my time working out in the field uh, as a rig supervisor, you know, if you want, a few oh. giggles, well, giggles, kind of a 30-year history. And, <laughs> and so typically okay. when I'm doing industry events, I tend to put it more on the, the public uh, Facebook page. Okay. No, that's great. And, and again, I, I I understand what you're saying, and I, and I don't want everyone to be like, hey, you know, reach out to Sean and start talking to her because the reality is, is like, this is not gonna happen. I have several people again, reaching out. And so the intent is more just to, to, again, whether follow you or, or just, you know, be connected as an industry. Um, mm -hmm. But for those, so, you know, if those are interested more about Shauna, check out her Facebook page. I'm sure you can, if you Google the, or if you search the name, you can find it. And then um, Oxy puts out, I mean, even the website has a ton of good information. Besides the website, is Oxy like? Does they have a you? Do they have a YouTube page or anything like that, or if just Oxy.com? Well, Oxy.com, we got a, a very active LinkedIn page. Yeah. Um. Also, to the you know, the, the company that we're very involved in, and now we're more involved because there was the announcement that we uh, did the big billion dollar acquisition. The rest of the equity part of Carbon Engineering which is our big partner, 1.5. So you just go to 1.5.com and that will give you a lot more information on the DAC, a lot of the point source capture work that we're doing. And to find it, it's the number one and then the word 0.5 altogether. Interesting. Cool. Okay. Well, there you had it, folks. Check that out. And for all the listeners, thanks again for joining us today. If you could, please share, review, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you have any ideas for a show or if you have any guests that you'd like me to have on, I would love to hear from you. Uh, and with that said, always remember that everyone deserves access to energy and we is greater than me. Thanks, everybody. 
Have you ever thought about what a podcast could do for your B2B business? Well, you might be surprised by the benefits it could offer. Firstly, podcasts provide an amazing opportunity to establish your brand as an industry thought leader. By sharing your insights, experiences, and expert opinions, you position yourself as an authority, gaining the trust and the respect of your audience. Secondly, hosting a podcast is a fantastic way to engage your customers on a deeper level. It's not just about promoting your products and services, it's about providing value through engaging content, fostering strong relationships, and loyalty among your listeners. Oh, and did I mention networking? Yes, that's a huge part. Podcasts are an incredible networking tool. When you interview guests from your industry, you're not only creating valuable content, but you're also building relationships that can lead to future partnerships and collaborations. But we know starting a podcast can feel daunting. I've had several people reach out to me lately asking how to create a podcast, and that's where I'm going to try and come in and help. I'm here to help you navigate the podcast world. Reach out to me for a 15-minute call where we can discuss your podcasting ambitions. Whether you're starting from scratch or simply looking to improve your existing show, I'm here to help. And guess what? I have a playbook too, a step-by-step -step guide to launching a successful podcast, and I can't wait to share it with you. This playbook has everything from topic brainstorming to technical setup to effective promotion strategies, all the essentials for a thriving podcast. So why wait? Get in touch today and let's embark on this podcasting journey together. After all, your voice deserves to be heard. Thanks. Thanks again for listening to another episode of Wicked Energy with JG. And look, if you or your organization wants to start a podcast, please visit my website and sign up for a free guide on how to start a successful podcast. Once you get through it, let me know if you have any questions or getting started. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. Peace.